And Peter came and he, he sort of watched Jesus for a while. But it's only later that he finally is alone enough with Jesus and he gets to know Jesus enough. And in Matthew 4, we read about Jesus' personal call to Peter. And he says, come follow me. Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. And Peter and, his, and Andrew immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. Um, you know, Pete, Jesus deals with this very able to He didn't ask Peter the first time that Andrew introduced Peter to Jesus. Jesus didn't say, come follow me. Peter wasn't ready for it. <clears throat> Peter, God, Jesus asks us to do things as we're prepared. Jesus asks us to do things as he begins the process of making us and prepares us for the various tasks that we have. But in Matthew 4, we see that Peter is ready to set it all aside. He's ready to set down his nets. You know, I, in my counseling program, I learned that the, the average person changes careers four or five times in the middle of their life. And I expect that, that when, when Peter first met uh, Jesus, he had no idea there was going to be a career change for him at that point. In fact, I think if we had gone to Peter and said, are you going to give up fishing? He said, no way. My grandfather was a fisherman. My dad was a fisherman. And I'm going to be a fisherman too. Mm -hmm. He had no idea that God had other plans for him. But when God asked him to change his plans, when he asked him to become not a fisher of fish, but a fisher of men, he was prepared and ready to serve Jesus. I never claim to know what God is asking you to do. I never claim to, to have any insight into what He's expecting of you and what, what, what your dreams and what you're watching in your heart. But God may ask you to do the unexpected. He may ask more of you than you think you're capable of doing. But if He does, know that you're ready to do it. He has prepared you to do whatever He may ask you to do. First of all, Peter was called. Well, I would hope that maybe being called by Jesus would take away all of life's problems. It didn't. Because the next event we look at, we find out that Peter was definitely scared. I don't think he was any more scared than you or I would be. Because if, if I was out in the boat in the middle of a storm, I'd be a little bit anxious. And then I look up and I see this ghostly figure walking toward me. And I'm not sure who it is at first. And then all of a sudden I think it's Jesus. And like Peter, I might say, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And I'm sure Peter didn't expect the answer when Jesus said, come. And so Peter takes his foot out, puts his foot on the water. Okay. Takes his foot out of the boat, puts it on the water. <laughs> all of a sudden he's underwater. He had enough faith to stay there for a few seconds. But all of a sudden he's in And I don't know that I would have had enough courage to take that one step out of that boat. Um, Peter's words as he, as he collapsed into the water was, Lord, save me. You know, fear was there even though he knew he was called by God. Um, you know, God sometimes uses fear in weird ways to, to, to get our attention, to get a hold of us. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, I don't know a whole lot about his story, but I know one of the events that took place in his life as a young man, he had yet, not yet decided what he was going to do, but he was out walking in the forest and contemplating his future, and all of a sudden, a lightning bolt hit the tree next to him, and there was enough electricity in the air, he just fell to the ground and collapsed. And he woke up. And he knew. He resolved. He committed himself to being a monk. And when he did that, he was following God. He had no idea that he was going to nail 95 pieces to the Wurttemberg church door. He knew, had no idea he was going to start the Reformation. But he knew he had to follow God into the next step. A uh, young missionary by the name of Jens Haven actually has more, probably, uh, uh, more history around here than he did... Uh, in Germany, uh, he, was a, he was a young man, didn't know what he was going to do, and he too was struck by lightning. 
And he was so convinced after being reco recovering from that event that he needed to be a missionary. He became involved with the Moravians. Uh, maybe you don't know, Sondra and I were kind of excited to find out that the Moravians were a group of believers that uh, greatly influenced John and Charles Wesley at the time of their conversion. And, and they also influenced Jens Haven. And he became a missionary in Labrador, which is just, just, just due north of here, well, maybe a little bit to the east of, of Quebec. Not far away. Sort of in our country. The northeast part of North America. And God, he became one of the first missionaries to the Indians who lived in that area of North America. You know, I expect that Peter's experience on the Sea of Galilee, that Lord saved me as he went into the water, had the same kind of impact on Peter as it did on Martin Luther or Jens Haven. Their life had to take a new course. You know, our emotions, whatever they are, Peter's case and Luther's case and Jen Haven's case, it was fear. But it may, be, it may be joy, it may be love, it may be kindness, it may be all kinds of emotions that could get, in, it could get into our lives. And those emotions can either take us close to God or take us away from God. Because it's very possible for the same fear that, that drew Peter and Martin Luther and Jen Havens to, to, to God, that same fear could have driven them away. God doesn't care for me. God doesn't exist. But our emotions can also draw us to God. Lord, save me. Lord, I'll follow you. How, are you, how do your emotions affect your religion? Do they keep you closer to God? Or do they draw you away from God? How do your emotions impact your relationship with God? Peter was called. Peter was scared. Thirdly, Peter was insightful. You know, it was Peter who first recognized that Jesus was the Son of God. You remember that Jesus was sort of standing around with his disciples, and he was asking them, who, who do people say that I am? And some said Elijah, others said Moses, and, and some said a prophet. And then Jesus turned to the disciples and said, who do you, who do you say that I am? And then there was this pregnant pause. You can almost hear it in the scriptures as you read it. There was this pregnant pause and, they, and just silence. And then all of a sudden, Peter, Peter was always the impetuous one. He was always the one that sort of just spurted things out without thinking. This time he got it right. Not always, but this time he did. Who do you say I am? And Peter replies, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Peter was quick, always quick. But this time he got it right. This time he got it right. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, a, man, a moment's insight is sometimes worth a lifetime's experience. It's really true in Peter's case. As he came to realize that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You know, we come to worship. We don't come to worship the stories. We don't come to worship the name per se. Yes, we lift it up and yes, we're very glad to know Jesus. We don't come to worship our feelings. We come to worship Jesus Christ, the living God. <clears throat> the Son of the living God. Peter may have been the first to understand it, but it's something we all have to grapple with. It's all that we all have to find to be true in our own lives, that we worship the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Called Scared, insightful. Peter was also privileged. It was a few weeks later. Uh, Jesus was going up to the mountaintop and he called Peter, James, and John to go with him. And as they gathered, uh, they thought it was just going to be another trip, another chance to hear Jesus speak. And nothing special, nothing really unique. But yet, Jesus knew it would be something unique. He had a surprise for them. Luke chapter 9, verses 28 and 36. At about eight days after this, Jesus said, then he took, said this. He, about, I'm going to start over again. About eight days after Jesus said this, he 
took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they, be, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Of course, he did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus <coughs> was alone. <coughs> the disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time what they had seen. You know, we call it the transfiguration, don't we? Mm -hmm. It's what? It's the, it's the time in which, uh, in some ways, it's an amazing time. I, I wrote my sermon notes, wow! I mean, can you imagine them in light? You know, I wear white when I come to church. It's just my, sort of my uniform. You know, I wear this white shirt and a tie. But it doesn't look like lightning. No. It's the brightest thing in here, maybe, except for uh, uh, her coat, but on the other hand, uh, it's the brightest thing, it's the second brightest thing in here. Um, you know, two men, Moses and Elijah, showed up. It would have been an amazing sight. And I think, like the apostles, I may have wanted to build a memorial. I may have wanted to build some kind of a, 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 a way to remember that event, that time that I was spending with Jesus. But then Jesus comes along and, oh, I know what it's like. You remember those V8 commercials? You probably have seen them. They come along and they go bonk on top of the head. Yeah. You could have had a V8. Yeah. I think it's abuse. I don't like that commercial. <laughs> to me, it's authorizing someone to hit somebody else. And I think it's yeah. totally inappropriate. But I think that's exactly what happened to, to Peter, James, and John that day. <laughs> because when they heard God's voice, when they heard God's voice in that cloud, this is my son, who am I chosen to listen to him? It was like a bonk. Yeah. This is my son. Listen to him. You don't need to build a memorial to Moses and Jesus and, and Elijah. Listen to Jesus. That's who you are here to worship. Bonk. I hope you don't go along bonking your neighbors because you have, because they didn't have V8. Or if they did have V8, keep your hands off. That's not a good thing. <laughs> bad, bad news. I've told my wife that and I think that I, I, I think that commercial is horrible. But I think that's Though I don't think God hit the disciples, I think that they got hit in the head with a piece of evidence that day. Yeah. Bonk, this is my son, listen to me. <coughs> you know, sometimes God catches us so I surprise. He, he gives us something that we weren't expecting. He gives us something, he makes us aware of something that we just didn't know or understand before. He shows us something that, that we, we just had missed in all the times we spent in worship, all the times we spent with God people. He, he shows us something new and unique and special that helps us to better understand Him. And that's what was going on in Peter, James, and John's life that day. Bonk! This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Peter was called. He was scared. He was insightful. He was privileged. And I think if that was all we had to know of Peter, we'd be great. But you know something? Peter blew it. Because the next thing we see of Peter was here we have a man who, who knew an awful lot about Jesus. But he blew it. It was the day of the crucifixion. You remember? Peter is out. In the crowd, Jesus is off, going off to Golgotha to be put on the cross. And they start accusing Peter. You knew him. No, I didn't. You were with him. No, I wasn't. Who do you think Peter would have learned? He had been in the transfiguration. He had had the insight. He had, he had had the privilege of knowing that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus had called him and told him to follow me. You'd think Peter would know it. But it's Peter who says, I didn't know him. 
I was never with him. Not once, not twice, but three times. And then how does God respond? I think I, think I know how God should have responded. Because I know what would happen if my boss, if I came in and I started talking about my boss the way Peter talked about Jesus. I don't know her. I don't know him. I was never part of that company. I would never spend any time with them. I would have been pretty angry. You know, there were ten other disciples. You don't count Judas. Now Peter's blown it. There were ten other disciples that could have taken over leadership of that group, that small group of apostles. And God could have chosen any one of them. But God didn't want to choose one of them. <clears throat> but Peter knows what he's done. He knows when that crop crows, and he hears it, cock a little do in the background. He knows that he has denied his Lord. And now he doesn't know what he's going to do. Now, if I stop there, it sounds like a pretty sad story. But you know, though Peter thought he couldn't be used again, Peter knows what he did. He knows what God probably will do. On the other hand, God, what Peter knows, isn't what God knows. Here's a man who's failed miserably. Here's a, a man who has walked away from his Lord and Savior. And yet God isn't very quick to give up on him. We've already read the final scene. The last scene we saw with Peter and Jesus alongside of the Sea of Galilee. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Peter answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then again, Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. Then the third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him this third time, Do you love me? But he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then Jesus said to Peter, follow me. You heard what the first instruction that Jesus gave to Peter? The first command when he called Peter to be his apostle? That command was, follow me. Mm -hmm. The last command reported in the gospel that, Peter, that Jesus gives to Peter is follow me. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've said or what you've thought. Follow him. Follow Jesus. It hasn't changed. The command is the same. Whether you've walked with Jesus for a for a day or whether you've walked with him for 40 years, the command stays the same. Follow me. Follow me. Are you willing to do it today? Are you willing to follow Jesus wherever he may want you to go? I don't know what he's asking of you today. I don't know what he wants from you. I'm not going to push you to something that you don't want to do. He may ask you to do something you didn't expect him to do, but that's his job, not mine. Mm -hmm. All I can ask you to do, follow him. Let's pray. Precious God, we ask that you would just be with us, that you would teach us to follow you. That goes for me as well. And though I, I, I look around and, I, and we've talked about it in terms of the, the people in this audience, we, we, we know it also applies to me. I regardless of how long I've known you, the one thing I need to do is I need to follow you. May we each do that. May we each follow you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. If we're going to
follow Jesus, we need to ask him to lead on, O King Eternal.